thank you so much again. Really, really appreciate being here and to REI. Also, we connect you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. So imagine as a portfolio manager in a managing agency, uh, walking in without feeling that queasy type of uneasy, anxious feeling, um, being completely, imagine being completely confident that you are going to go through the day without having to deal with those difficult, complex issues where you feel out of control um, and you feel out of your depth, to be honest. Well, you'll say, pull the other leg, uh, you know, does that actually exist? Will, uh, will, uh, will those problems just dissolve or will they, you know, will they disappear into the ether? At the end of the day, um, you know, we've got to deal and cope with challenges and problems as they hit us. And one has to work or walk rather through the proverbial fire to be able to be in a position to utilize the tools that you have to face these challenges. And you know, Priya said earlier on, wow, it's so, so difficult. Um, we've got clients who are, are becoming more aggressive, difficult, demanding. And absolutely, at the end of the day, that's what we find too, Priya. And I'm a seasoned attorney. I've been in this game for 23 years. And there's still people who are, I find intimidating. So I can only imagine what it's like for managing agents. So we talk about pressure points today. In the human body, um, we have pressure points. And in Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine, these pressure points, when they're manipulated, you feel a bit of pain. But ultimately, you find some relief. I've been asked today to talk about the top three legal pressure points that um, property managers are facing in our industry. Um, I could speak about so many more than three. But if we get started, we, we can. And I've spoken to all our managing agents and BBM attorneys, we have five offices across all the provinces and ultimately chatting to all the managing agents over the last two weeks, um, they're common threads. And certainly I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing with you what these pressure points are. So sit back, relax, and let me massage the pain out and hopefully just relieve you a little bit um, of these pressure points. So the first thing, a new broom sweeps clean, and, and Zelinda, my colleague, alluded to this earlier, but I'd like to just unpack it for you a little bit. So this is where your new trustees are replacing the old guard, um, and isn't that just a bit of a nightmare? Because sometimes you get new trustees who are all, you know, fresh and uh, can be a bit aggressive because they haven't liked the way that the old trustees are dealing with things. They've been dying to get rid of you. As the managing agent, they come on board and you as managing agents find yourselves in quite a precarious position. And before we discuss or go into what you can do and, and, and what tools you can use to assist yourselves in this position, I just want to do a little refresher on the appointment and termination of managing agents. So we go to the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act and we look at Management Rule 28.5 of the Sectional Title Schemes Act, Management Act, and it's the appointment of managing agents. Appointing a managing agent is not difficult. Your trustees can appoint a managing agent, and that's by way of um, ordinary, absolutely um, ordinary resolution of the trustees, and each trustee has one vote. That's just by the way, that's a question I'm being asked a lot lately. Uh, can trustees vote by PQ? No. Trustees vote by little show of hands of, of how many trustees there are. Your chairperson obviously has a casting vote, but trustees can so easily vote for managing agent. 51% uh, of owners, if they decide by ordinary resolution, can also vote for a managing agent. And there you need to look at and say 51% um, by way of value. So that's by PQ. It's no longer one hand, one vote. So this is just a bit of a refresher course. Also by a bondholder of at least 25% in number of primary sections. If you guys can get a bondholder to show any interest um, in sectional title or bodies corporates, really, I'd love to, I'd love to find them. Okay, management rule 28.6. Now we're talking about the agreement or that contract between the body corporate and the managing agent. So an agreement between the body corporate and a, and, and a managing agent has to obviously comply with all the regulations in the sectional title schemes management act and i mean that goes without saying your your contract must be in place for a maximum of three years and it doesn't have to be in writing anymore that's something i would definitely change um, if i were redrafting 
any laws here because it's so much easier when you have something in writing, you can see it. Um, it's right there and you can see the terms and conditions. Right, now we go to the cancellation of the agreement. And this must be a question that pops up on my desk at least twice or three times a day when people are phoning to say, how can we get rid of our managing agent? And I understand that that's in most circumstances very unfair, but it is a reality. And I think uh, I would say to people who are trying to cancel a contract of a managing agent, the first prize way of, co of cancellation is obtaining a 75% special resolution of the body corporate, which gives the managing agent two months notice thereafter. And that 75% special resolution is in number and in value. So that's important uh, to, to, to know. And that's the best, that's the safest way. You're not going to be faced with penalties. You're not going to be faced with damages claims if you do that the right way. The riskier way of cancelling, obviously, is where owners or, tra or trustees, owners or trustees, by 51% ordinary resolution, just cancel that management agreement in accordance with its terms. So that would mean that if there's been a breach of contract and a breach of contract is often very very difficult to prove so you know you could face the music if a managing agent doesn't like that Spookies once said the secret of change is to focus all your energy not on fighting the old but on building the new well when you get your newly appointed set of trustees coming in they often have historical gripes as Linda said with ex-trustees they believe the managing agent was complicit in making decisions, um, you know, and they want to effect changes as soon as possible. So it really is a case of a new broom sweeps clean. Um, but the pressure pain point when new trustees are the bad ones is all very well. And sometimes it's a great thing when new trustees come in and managing agents, you know, you, you clap but really, really hard when you guys come in. But when the new trustees are the bad bunch, that becomes an issue. They want to cut costs by taking shortcuts. They want to enter litigation against ex-trustees. And that becomes uh, really, really problematic. They obtain quotes by unethical means. We've got a really large complex here in on the East Rand where uh, the estate manager's contract has just been, uh, you know, terminated without any thought of the consequences going forward. We've had um, different contractors being appointed unethically, like the you know the 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 owners ex-brother-in-law kind of where your your hats are, are are different that you're wearing, and that's um, unethical. And they actually want to remove you. They've got hidden agendas, and that's really from the outset what they are aiming to do. So as a managing agent, the managing agent faces reputational harm, uh, the threat of legal action, being cited as a co-defendant in a magistrate's court or high court action, or in the community scheme on um, service application. You are going to get dragged kicking to litigation, sometimes whether you like it or not. And my advice to everybody who's listening would be have a strategy, have a plan. Um, you know, um, Zalinda and Dani mentioned, Zalinda talked about a jackable praise where we where portfolio managers have got to do everything. Dani actually set out a really impressive um, breakdown of what portfolio managers have to be doing all day. You've got to have somebody who's a little bit different in your company who takes on the legal stuff because it's a distraction, it's a disruption, and it creates a huge amount of stress for your portfolio manager. So just think about setting up a strategy to deal with these things. Uh, it's also a cost of you. So I've got some advice for you on your pressure relief here. Firstly, ensure that you have insurance in place to cover the prospect of litigation. And that's um, top of mind for me. Set boundaries at the beginning of this new relationship. So as soon as a set of new trustees come in, have a meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting where you discuss things that have maybe gone, you know, what they think wrong in the past. Uh, set the boundaries that you, you're not going to kind of tolerate going forward on, on a bad footing and that you do have a reputation to predict. Communicate your reasons for utilizing the different contractors that you're utilizing. Maybe they don't know what your rationale is. Maybe they've just heard gossip in the complex around how you've operated. 
We know that building trust is tough. Uh, you've got to walk this sort of objective tightrope and it's, it's truly a delicate dance. Something that you may want to consider at the beginning of this relationship might be uh, mediation. Mediation is a great opportunity to be able to reconfigure a relationship with new trustees. And it's an action opportunity to possibly do better yourselves um, and, and you know, take criticism constructively as it's supposed to be taken. Okay, so pressure point two, health and safety headaches. A lot of my managing agents said managing agents um, are worried because all this pressure being placed on them to be compliant in terms of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, just getting too much. And we know that trustees of sectional title schemes have to in law adhere to the Occupational Health and Safety Act um, 85 of 2003. And that act's purpose is actually to protect people who are working in the scheme from potential hazards. So if you've got somebody on a ladder, if you've got somebody who's utilizing machinery, some contractor who, who, who's come on board, so just consider it's a little bit difficult to use. And, and I know that managing agents want to use, um, sometimes because they're cheaper, they're sort of bucky brigade guys who come into the complexes. But I think, you know, if I was working in that kind of environment, I would really just from a safety point of view, just go for the, the guys who've got a bit more of a reputation. I've said here, contractor, contractors should sign an indemnity holding the body cor corporate harmless in respect of any claims against them. So I have a contract here in front of me. Um, it's an agreement in terms of Section 37.2 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And Every contractor who signs, who comes and works in that complex should be signing an agreement like this. It's two, three pages. It's nothing daunting. Um, if any of you would like a copy of this agreement, please, with pleasure. Um, I'm very, very happy to provide it at, at no cost. It talks about things like your contractor has to warrant that all its employees, agents, contractors, or subcontractors are registered and covered in terms of the Compensation for Occupational Injuries Act, so that you as the body corporate are getting further and further away from any claim if something should happen, if someone falls through a roof, falls off a ladder, falls off the roof, you know, whatever happens, very dangerous. So that managing agents are concerned that they, you know, trustees are taking this legal compliance and placing it squarely on the shoulders of the managing agent. If we talk about compliance in terms of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, you know, let's just break it down. What are we actually talking about? Get a bit practical. So the first thing is signage, signage around the complex. And um, since the Poppy Act and uh, all your consumer protection acts, we've been inundated with questions around disclaimer signs. And yes, you do have to have disclaimer signs around your complex. It's vital. And those disclaimer signs need to be placed in a prominent position. Also, signs which show in any kind of evacuation process should be, be a fire. And um, that is pretty important, uh, I would say. And with poppy, include your poppy disclaimers in your normal disclaimer signs. I think disclaimers can't be underestimated. And I think that they need to also show where your fire, your, your firefighting equipment is. Um, also that there are stairs with handrails. That's pretty important. We had a case in the Equality Court that went against our body, uh, body corporate that I um, acted for, um, where they didn't have those kind of signs showing where the rails were, that was a problem. Also, lifts, lifts, we need uh, procedural signs both inside and outside the lifts should anything go wrong to in indicate potential um, hazards. And all lifts have to undergo a monthly checkup. Uh, after that, I think it's 24 months, every 24 months, you've got to have a comprehensive um, maintenance update and, and you need to, to, to get a report. From, from somebody to comply with the Occupational Health and Safety Act from the people who are fixing these lifts. And that you don't want any dramas with lifts at the end of the day. So a vigorous inspection is necessary. If we go to pools, obviously pools goes without saying. Disclaimer signs, disclaimer signs, disclaimer signs. You also need a spring activated um, lock uh, there on, at, your, at your pool. 
and a net is also imperative. I think that's uh, the, the, the sign's got to be visible. Don't put it at the back of the pool where no one can see it. Place it right in front as you're opening the gate. Firefighting equipment. Firefighting equipment, I think uh, you need to keep a register of all the firefighting equipment. Um, and as far as my knowledge of the Occupational Health and Safety Act is you have to have a sticker on that fire uh, equipment, firefighting equipment showing when it's going to expire. Um, we've had many cases, I remember a really bad case in Cape Town, where the trustees were held, this was early on actually in my career, where the trustees were held personally responsible um, because they didn't have firefighting equipment on every level at these, their, their complex. Also compliance certificates, we know our normal electricity compliance certificates, uh, electric fence compliance certificates, have them available and just keep them in a, in a nice index so that you know exactly what you're doing. Cleaning contractors, cleaning contractors, you've got to watch very carefully where they're cleaning, there must be signs up around where they're cleaning so that uh, you know, nobody uh, trips and falls, and there, there are no issues with um, with them them becoming involved in contracted or protracted rather litigation. Then you've got public liability cover. Uh, we know that it can't be less than ten million rand. Um, important for, for for you to advise the the body corporate about all these things. Before I go on to how you can relieve the pressure here, I just wanted to also talk to you about. Deploy versus the Cascades Body Corporate. It's an old case, it's a 2013 case. And you know, I've always found the facts quite extraordinary. The, the, the gist of it, just so that, you know, from, from a quick explanation point of view, is that there's a legal duty to ensure that the property is in a safe condition um, so that all owners and all visitors can walk around that complex and the, the judge said it's no different to a hotel. Um, it's you know it's no different to any kind of business, a body corporate. And the facts of this case were were quite interesting. The body corporate, they were quite a robust bunch, and they they really cared about their scheme, and they needed to find an employee or somebody to run the the, the maintenance and repairs, like a caretaker type of person. And Mr. Deploy <clears throat> was very well known in the scheme for complaining and always being extremely pedantic about what was going on in the scheme. So the body corporate thought, what, who, what, who better to, to put in charge of this than Mr. Deploy, which they did. And he was apparently very excited. He drew up schedules. He had his teams out every day. Unfortunately, Mr. Deploy uh, slipped and fell on some they call it slime moss in the scheme next to the washing lines and uh, he hurt himself pretty badly so he decided to take the cascades body corporate as well as the managing agent as a second defendant again managing agent dragged to court all the time as a second defendant to court so what happened here was that the judge found for the body corporate and dismissed deploys claims they did say and this is what the gist of it is important because it did come out that there is a legal duty on, on the body corporate but in this case the body corporate um, was uh, successful in, in, in proving that they actually had not been negligent and that Deploy should have known the lay of the land, specifically since he was in charge of most of it um, and he didn't get the monies that he thought he might be getting. Also, they found the managing agent to be really, the judge used the words diligent and conscientious um, in her duties and she wasn't in any way liable either. So your pressure relief now in terms of this maintenance story, managing agents must assist in setting up these compliance procedures, but they are not liable in law, um, actually, at the end of the day. You need to ensure that both your contract and your correspondence to the body corporate reflects the correct position. So again, don't be scared. If you're seeing that there are problems, maintenance issues, that people could be slipping, falling, that the disclaimer signs are not good, and the body corporate refuses to engage with you, or the body corporate says, look, now we're not interested, you know, we've got, we've got other fish to fry, put it in a letter. You have to tell them all the time what you're doing. You know, we don't agree with you. You are making yourself vulnerable. You are opening up yourself to various claims going forward and keep that in a file. Important, create a paper trail, setting out your concerns. Um, I think that's what we can get, you know, glean out of, out of that. 
moving right along, we're talking about um, the Property Practitioners Act. Do you know what's potting? Well, I think a lot of lawyers don't actually know what's, uh, what's potting on the Property Practitioners Act. It's been a long time coming. Um, it, it's, it's really shaken up the industry and it was signed into law during September 2019 and became effective on the 1st of February 2022. And I think the primary purpose is obviously to address um, transformation in the property sector and um, to integrate and obviously consolidate all role players and to address the inefficiencies of all the, the previous systems. From the point of view of portfolio managers, every portfolio manager now within the management agency has to have a fidelity fund certificate. So that's a, a PPSXD, Property Practitioner's Fidelity Fund Certificate. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the act in great detail. I'm just going to take out what I thought was interesting for the for the purposes. Um, if you see the Fidelity Fund Certificate cannot be given to non-South African citizens, anyone with a criminal or civil uh, criminal or civil conviction involving fraud or dishonesty, an unrehabilitative insol uh, rehabilitated insolvent or a person of unsound mind, persons without a valid tax certificate, any person found guilty by any court or tribunal of unfair discrimination against anyone on the basis of race or gender. Mm. I found that quite really interesting because that's never been done before. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's great. It's, it's important. Persons who are not in possession of a valid DE certificate cannot have a validity fund certificate. Um, and that's what we're going to unpack now. <coughs> Excuse me. But the Property Practitioners Regulatory Authority, the PPRA, which is the old Estate Agency Affairs Board, will issue fidelity fund certificates in the future. And what I'd like to just drill down into is this broad-based Black economic empowerment situation, because one of the major components of this Property Practitioners Act is, is transformation. Uh, and again, I think it's, it, can, it should be highly valued and I think it's the only way to be going. I'm also really, really um, worried about the fact that our industry, that the sectional title industry, has not moved along from a transformation point of view at all, yet, in my view. And I think we really, really need to, to all, we, there's a responsibility in all of us to press that. All right, so how do you determine compliance with BEE in our industry? Well, we've got to go backwards a little bit. We've got to look at the amended property sectors code, which has identified three property sectors, residential, commercial, and other sectors. If we then go and take other sectors, um, it's property development, property ownership, and property services. Sectional title, the community schemes, it's obviously property services. So if we look at property services, it talks to property management, estate agents, brokers, and facilities management. And all business, business in all sectors are classified by turnover, by size. And that's how we determine uh, where we are or which level we are. I just want you to, uh, to alert you to a little bit of an issue that we've got here at the moment. And it's prompted me to ask for outside advice. Are managing agents, property managers, some of them are property managers and facilities managers, but they're also state agents because managing agents are defined as estate agents in terms of the old Estate Agency Affairs Board Act. So it brings me to our next point. How do you determine where, what level you are? Well, sometimes as a managing agent, you're completely exempted. So you're an exempted micro enterprise. Right, let's distinguish now between estate agents and property managers. Estate agents and brokers and valuers, if your turnover is below 2.5 million per annum, then you simply need an affidavit citing turnover. You will automatically qualify for a level four certification as an estate agent. 
But if you're a property manager or, and or a facilities manager, if your turnover is below 10 million rand, then you would need that affidavit. And again, you qualify for level uh, four certification. So I wasn't sure about this. Now, are you an estate agent or you're a property manager? So I wrote to one of the big um, uh, BB. EE -E, um, compliance companies, one of the largest in the country, and uh, an advocate by the name of Lane Boshoff came back to me and said that she would say that managing agents are uh, would fall under property managers. So that's still subject to a little bit of debate, but I'm sure we'll gain clarity as we move forward, because like all these acts, the dust needs to settle. People need to come into the whole operational side of this, this act. Um, and which we'll only see at the at probably the end of the year. Okay, so qualifying small enterprises, we move on called QSEs. Estate agents between two and a half million and 35 million must comply with something called the QSE scorecard. So that's that's quite complicated. It's it's a, it's you know more burdensome, it's more onerous, um, and you need to, to jump through a couple of hoops on that. If you're a property manager and a facilities manager then the threshold is between 10 million and 50 million, and you must comply with the QSE scorecard. And my last category here is a generic entity. So these are the huge, like an estate agency with turnover over 35 million per annum, much bigger. They must comply uh, with the generic scorecard, and so must property managers and facility managers over that have, you know, over 50 million uh, turnover per annum. If an EME or a QSE, this is a whole new language for everybody, is 51% black owned, they'll qualify as a level two. And if 100% black owned, they'll qualify for level one. Okay, so there we go. Other points of interest on the Property Practitioners um, Act. As you're, if you're sitting here as a portfolio manager or you head up a managing agency, just remember from now you're on all your letterheads and your marketing material, a guarantee regarding the existence of your fidelity fund certificate must appear. The professional wording is registered with a PPRA. So just pop that onto all your, all your correspondence so people can see it. All agreements must contain a sentence with the following prescribed wording. Name of property professional. So if you wanted to say Marina Constas hereby warrants the validity of her fidelity fund certificate as a date of signature of this agreement, all your, your contracts, your managing agency contracts must, must have that included. Um, just bear in mind that attorneys um, don't, uh, don't are not defined as property practitioners. Um, we've got our own law society regulations and fidelity fund certificates to comply with. Regulation 35 of the Act talks to undesirable practices. So bodies, corporates, and homeowners associations are not allowed to oblige owners to sell their properties through a panel of agents to the exclusion of others. Always a bone of contention at every seminar I've ever spoken at, especially the very large community schemes, the HOAs, uh, have come to me and said, you know what, I want to sell my property, but they tell me that there's a panel of five large estate agents, and they're the only ones who are allowed to sell in, in my scheme. And that is now very much not something that you're going to be able to do. There's nothing wrong with procedures, which a lot of estate managers put in place, to get the estate agents up to speed with what they're doing, how, the, how everything runs, nothing wrong with really um, asking your estate agents to follow all the directives given at these meetings. You can have a meeting, you can have something in writing, but certainly you're not, a, you're not able, it's been it's anti, completely anti-competitive. And that's the undesirable practice that the Community Scheme Ombud Service is also, when I sat on their board, they were exceptionally anti um, these kind of anti-competitive processes. Okay, we know that the Fidelity Fund certificates will be issued for a period of three years, all applications to be submitted by 1 October in the year that your current certificate expires. Unfortunately, you're not entitled to any payment if you don't have a Fidelity Fund certificate at the time of performing your, your different services. And I think the consumer is going to really love that one and really what you know want to um, 
take you over the coals and, and, and complain about that. So just be careful. The Fidelity Fund Certificate must be prominently displayed in every place of business where the agency conducts property transactions. And that obviously refers to um, both the uh, managing agency and the estate agency. Uh, there's also something important here, and there's a, a new limitation on relationships with other service providers. As a property practitioner, you are not allowed to enter into any arrangement where a consumer is obliged or encouraged to use a particular service provider. So in chatting to my managing agent clients, they're very concerned about this limitation. And again, it's going to take quite a long time to unpack what this means. One of my managing agencies, well, you know, owner trustees don't have a clue who to use under certain circumstances. So we've got a list that we give them. There's a list we give them and we, you know, we'll say this guy's good. We've worked with him in the past. Don't use this guy, whatever it is. So, Marina, Neil here, yeah. two minutes, two minutes to go. Can you wrap up? Thank we are you. running a little bit over yeah. time. Thanks. That's fine. Just, so just exercise a little bit of caution. For me, I think that arrangement might be a financial arrangement, and that's really what we are trying to avoid. So hopefully I've relieved your stress and your pressure points a little bit. Um, if I haven't, then all I can say is, you know, there's a, a book that we can look at recommending here, and that is Trigger Point Therapy for My Facial Pain, The Practice of Informed Touch, if that still doesn't work and you guys are still stressed out, I would recommend sitting quietly on in the privacy of your exclusive use balcony, smoking some cannabis, arrogant in the knowledge that you are on the right side of the law. Thank you so much. Thank you, Neil, again. And thank you, REI, uh, for hosting Great. this one.